welcome to the nonprofit show. We are so glad you're here. And maybe you are joining us again because this is a special week. We don't do these very often throughout the year, but we are honored to have our third annual nonprofit power week with none other than the Dave Thomas Foundation for Adoption. Today we have with us not a new guest, but this is her first appearance this week. So Jill Krombacher has joined us. She is the Senior Vice President of Marketing and Development at the Dave Thomas Foundation for Adoption. And I'm excited to learn from you as you share with us, Jill, best practices in particular around testing your marketing plan. So honored to have this dedicated nonprofit Power Week because November is special to your mission, which is National Adoption Month. And so we've really helped you, you know, and the entire organization bring more education to the sector across the globe so that other individuals can join your force, advocate, you know, do all the great work that we need to be doing for so many youth. So thrilled to have you here with us today. Again, if you haven't met us yet, Julia Patrick, she's here, of course. She would not miss this week, no. CEO of the American <laughs> Nonprofit Academy. And I'm Jarrett Ransom, co-host, also nonprofit nerd and CEO of The Raven Group. Again, honored to serve alongside day in and day out because of our amazing partners. Mm -hmm. So a shout out of gratitude goes to our friends at mm -hmm. Fundraising Academy with National University, Bloomerang, your part-time controller, nonprofit thought leader, American Nonprofit Academy, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Nerd, as well as Nonprofit Tech Talk. These are the companies, just like the Dave Thomas Foundation for Adoption, that have allowed us these opportunities to have conversations of high, high level. We get into the weeds, we get into some heavy conversations, but they're all around what could serve you and your nonprofit organization. Good news, if you missed any of our previous episodes or any of the previous episodes of the Dave Thomas for, for Foundation for Adoption team members this week, we've got you covered. You can download the app and uh, watch, listen to us on the app. You can also stream us on broadcast as well as podcast platforms. So we are here for you, your, your viewing pleasure. Mm -hmm. um, but again, we are thrilled for our guest today. She's joined us previously, again, third annual but we, what we love truly with Jill Krumbacher, you are one of our rare guests, Jill, yeah. that serves in a dual role. And that is that you oversee marketing as well as development. So welcome back to you. Thank you. It's a always a pleasure to be with you, ladies. You always make this a fun conversation. So I'm excited. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> okay. First, I've got to ask, and, and I know... I know things change, but I, could you just kind of give us an overall about how many people are on your team mm -hmm. and how you really do have two major focuses that you bring together? Can you share Absolutely. a little bit Absolutely. with us a, a little bit? Sure, sure. So we've been a growing team and we're still growing. We currently have um, on both teams combined. So we have a marketing team and a fundraising team um, that I'm that I manage. And we have about 22 folks all together. So we've got, um, you know, roughly, it's roughly split in half okay. um, it, between those numbers. So we've got, you know, a sizable marketing department and, and fundraising department. And their work for us is so intertwined that it's just, um, we decided not to try to separate it. So we're wow. one group. Yeah. Wow, it's amazing. I've got to ask it, within you the structure. I mean, I, I would imagine you do have some remote employees, but mm -hmm. are your teams like physically together or are they kind of adjacent? Like, how do they physically interact and engage? Because so many departments completely split off, and a lot of times they're not even in the same buildings or cities. Right. We are still mostly based here in Columbus, Ohio. We have a, um, a beautiful three-story building um, that we get to spread out in. We've got a few employees that are remote, um, but for the most part, the marketing and fundraising team are all here. Um, and we all are on the first floor of this building together. So um, we're all on the same floor. Um, we, we've got, you know, some some, you know, our marketing team's kind of over here and our fundraising team's over here, but we're all on the same floor. We're sharing the same kitchen. We're, we're one big department. We're celebrating each other's birthdays together, you know, all of that. So we really do physically, um, 
sit in the same space, really. Good. It's yeah. good to know. It's it's yeah. it's fascinating. Yeah, and it you know I was sharing earlier. My preference is when there is a Jill Krombacher, there mm-hmm. is someone that oversees both of those moving pieces because they work so synergistically. I believe yeah. if we're doing it right. Yeah. So you at the organization has done a lot of fantastic work. You've done that, but let's talk about how you have tested marketing. And in particular, we're going to talk about how testing marketing is not revenue measurement. This kind of had me perplexed when I first looked at that. So (laughs) what does that mean? Well, revenue was part of a measure, but it is not the only measure by far. And really to be, to be, you know, truthful with the audience, we are still on this journey of, of figuring this out. So I don't come from a, we have this all figured out, you know, posture, but we have realized that we need to test our marketing because there are two, we believe there are two key components to raising money. Our, our, our goal in raising money, um, we have to have a lot of mar- fundraising efforts, which the marketing team supports all of those through all of their channels, whether it's direct mail or digital, right? They're supporting all of those. Um, but also to fundraise, you have to have brand awareness. Somebody's got to know who you are. Right. right. And that is 100% a marketing function. So we are always measuring both. We are measuring revenue and if that's going up, but we measure our brand awareness and it is a tough thing to move. We are a national organization. So we are measuring our national brand awareness and it's really hard. You know, you've got organizations out there that can spend hundreds of million dollars a year to get their messages and brands built, you know, in the for-profit space. Um, but you have to have both of those things. And so, you know, really we came to this journey of realizing we had to measure marketing because our fundraising dollars were going up because of the volume of fundraising, but our brand awareness wasn't going up as much as we would like to see it. And so we're sitting here perplexed, Mm -hmm. both work together. When your volume of fundraising is going up, there's more communications out and more people will know of you, but we weren't really lifting that national brand awareness as much as we wanted. And so it left us with the question of why not is something wrong with our creative? Now Mm -hmm. there are, right. There are some of the things that we do um, are fundraising focused, but you, you might not know the difference between just a brand awareness. We spend money just on brand awareness and we spend money just, you know, on fundraising and the differences can be slight in, in, you know, in how you're doing things and if revenue is coming in and your call to action at the end of it, but we are spending money on both things. And um, so we started to ask ourselves, okay, well, before we spend a whole lot more money on brand awareness, just getting our name out there, we got to make sure we have the best creative. It could be you all, it's this, it's the Super Bowl one-on-one conversation, right? Wasn't this ad so hilarious, whatever mm-hmm. the storyline was, everybody's talking about it the next day, but nobody remembers what the organization was. It's right. the same thing here. Right. And so as we're trying to grow nationally, <clears throat> we've got great causes. And if someone's just feeling like being more philanthropic or they come into a windfall of money, who knows something exciting, they're thinking, who am I going to give this to? Yeah. If you're a name that can come up in that outside of they received a fundraising letter or they saw something digitally, if you are a name that they can think of, that puts you in an opportunity that you wouldn't be in. So we want both. We want brand awareness and cause awareness, the cause of foster care adoption to grow. And we want our fundraising dollars to to grow. And so we realized we need to start testing our creative to say, at the end of this, after they've watched this along with 10 other things, do they even remember who we were? Did our name get through? Um, or do we need to change our creative so that our name is bigger and bolder and in this place instead of that place and yeah. all of that kind of stuff? So let's ask you to dig into that brand awareness testing because that's a heavy lift. And I would imagine most teams are just frantically 
worried about their creative and not even the deeper men meaning. So mm -hmm. what does this look like to you? And, and how do you measure this along yeah. with the retention? Right. So what we, um, what we decided to do is we started reaching out to, to research, you know, firms to help advise us say, we need to know if we're stacking up, if after somebody watches our ad, um, and again, we're, we are looking at radio, so could be hearing it. We're looking at PSAs, which are heavily TV um, right. for us. Um, we're looking at digital ads, billboard ads. So all of those things. How do we know that they're going to remember our name? We can triple our spending and they're still not going to remember our name because something's wrong with it, right? So, um, and we've gone about it in a couple of ways. So one is of your set of creative, how do you know which one's best? This billboard ad or this one? you know, within your own set of creative. So you can test against your own creative. And that would look something like um, you partner with someone online, um, a survey company, let's say, and they show your billboard ad. And then they ask the consumer a bunch of questions that have nothing to do with you. And at the end, they say, what was that billboard ad? What organization was that for at the beginning? And that's not that expensive. It's online research. They're already doing the survey anyway. You're inserting a question into like, let's say an omnibus, you know, a big sure. regularly occurring survey online. Mm -hmm. And so you can insert all of, you know, your creative and see which one of your pieces is, is at the end of that doing better. Um, so we do that to sort of narrow down which of our creative is the best for, for holding our brand at the end of it. But then we didn't feel like that was enough. Then we take our best ad and we put it in what's called a scatter reel. <laughs> so this is where an online researcher would show our ad along with a bunch of other nonprofit ads. Mm -hmm. And then they would say, which organizations did you just see? Mm -hmm. And then we're like, well, we didn't stack up against this organization and any of these, why, you know? And there's no exact, all you can do is sort of look at that ad and be like, what is it about it? Okay, well, they had a bigger logo or it was a different color or it was, it was on the bottom of the screen the entire time or it was whatever it was. Those are kind of the two ways that we're going about trying to figure out if our brand name is sticking um, in, in what we do. That is so fascinating it for is. me. I'm curious, and I've not done my research on this, Jill, so I own up to this. Has the organization, Dave Thomas Foundation for Adoption, ever changed its branding? Yes. Okay. We have. Okay. As far as our fonts and our colors and the images right. we use, that sort of brand personality, who we are, we have. Yes. Yeah. I'm just so curious because when that conversation comes up for nonprofits, right, they think that is the silver bullet. If we yeah. just change our colors, if we just change our name, if we just become an acronym instead of this big, long, verbose title, that is going to be the right. slam dunk that we're looking for. Mm -hmm. Right. I feel mm -hmm. like that is such a misnomer. Mm -hmm. I think it's part of the story. You know, I don't, re I remember reading somewhere that, um, Feeding America really saw a big difference when they changed to Feeding America. And before that, it was like, I'm going to get it wrong, but it was some food bank, you know, um, yep. harvest food banks, make it harvest, something like that. But that that they really felt like sometimes a name change can make a big interaction, but without major dollars and without, you know, it, it's not going to matter that much. And I think you have to be careful how often you change things like that because you want things to stick and you want that to look like your brand. And so when you've just built that, right. you don't want to just totally, re if you redo it, you have to think about that. I'm not going to be recognizable. I've changed my colors. I've changed my brand. Sometimes what's better is to just turn the dial. It's a, not a redo. Do. It's just turn the dial a little bit. Right. Yeah. Um, and that can help retain some of that brand look and feel, but keep it fresh and new. Yeah. I love That's it. really that. great advice. You do a lot of multi-channel and we know that for sure, right? Mm -hmm. And so talk to us about, you know, what you've seen in regards to your fundraising channels, which include email, digital, direct mail, probably others. Mm -hmm. What have you tested by way of these platforms and any others that maybe we haven't mentioned? Yes. 
So a lot of these are direct, you know, they are fundraising measures. And so you do use fundraising as a metric, but it's not your only metric, clearly. Um, fundraising is one, but, you know, anyone who's worked in the space for a while and kept track of their data, you know, you're looking at clicks. Yeah. Um, you're looking at opens. You're looking at opt outs. <laughs> like, I don't want to see this anymore. I'm opting out. All of that stuff tells you something. If if um, if they don't open your email, they can't read your message. So what is it about your subject line? What is it about the sender? You know, we have tested different senders of our emails and, and a lot of organizations do. A lot for us, a, a lot of times it's Rita, she's our CEO, but sometimes we've when we have a big fundraising ask, we put Wendy Thomas, um, the Wendy, uh, Dave Thomas's daughter Wendy, um, as the signer or the chair of our board or just other people. And it's amazing the different open rates you will find when a different you know name pops in there. Um, so for email, I think that's really important on all of it. Um, fonts, colors, donate buttons that are one color instead of another um, is really important to test. On direct mail, um, kind of what I've learned is a, a lot of it is not... It's not what they would teach you in, in um, English class about these beautiful paragraphs that are, you know, you know, four or five longs. No, they're like one sentences with tons of under underlines and half of it's read right. and and right. it's two pages long. Who wants a two page letter? Right. But but that's <laughs> when you test it, that's what works. People yeah. actually ingest reading by sentences and they get lost in the paragraphs. And yeah. and so I think, yeah. you know. Testing options in a lot of these channels is just by continually testing a couple of sets of creatives, that classic A-B testing, and you can do it with a lot of money and you can do it with not much money. Anyone can send two emails. Just try to keep as much about it consistent as possible. Send them on the same day at the same time right. to a, an equally split list of locations that, you know, as much as you can keep as much as you can consistent so that the only difference is the creative is as much as you can and see what different response rates you get. Um, and so you can do that over and over again um, is continually changing. And then once you've learned something, not assume that that lasts forever, things change right. over the years. Yeah. I love that um, you said that. I love that you yeah. said, let me ask you this. And I know Jarrett has a question, but I wanna jump in on, in terms of the creative, do you try and mimic the creative standards for email, you know, anything digital and direct mail so that there's that branding message is consistent or have you developed specific branding measurements or, or uh, protocols for those different uh, channels? We, you know, the one for us that is most different because we found in testing and with our partners that behave the most different was direct mail. Um, our direct mail, our brand is still the same, but again, the way we write it and the way it looks is not um, what performs the best is not clean and neat. It's sort of all of those things that I just described, whereas your other, you know, digitally and your website doesn't quite look that way. So okay. our brand is the same, but there is, there are definitely differences um, where we have found doing things a little differently and therefore it looks different. Yeah. Um, does pay off in some of those channels. Why? I don't fully understand. I just know that <laughs> yeah, no, it, I, it I, matters. That's why, that's why I had to ask the question because it's mm -hmm. it's really a very interesting and sensitive um, thought process to be mm -hmm. looking at your creative, you know, depending on where it's going to go and, and what right. the medium is. So yeah, Jared, right. I'm sorry, I jumped on top of you. Say, I've been so grateful to have my hands on a lot of different donor databases with the organizations I've had the pleasure of working with, Jill. And there are some systems that provide that A-B testing inside their software. And I just yes. think that's fascinating. It makes it easy. It makes it enticing. So yep. I'm curious, how often are you testing an email? Are you testing a direct mail piece? Are you testing an ad, right? Like how often are you doing some of this market research? Great question. You know, I think whenever you step into something new, you have to test it. So if, if it's your first entree into it, for instance, in direct mail, 
Um, we sent out a couple of different packages and some are to current donors and some are to acquisition audiences. So we, sure. right. So you're trying to acquire donors right. and we do a test between two packages and the one that fares best is the one we use for the next mm, year, year and a half. Okay. Um, and then, you know, we sort of let that write it, see how the return rates are going. And it was probably be 18 months to two years. We would retest on something like that. Um, Here. I think um, on, on email, it's probably, it, it's similar um, as far as the frequency goes. Um, but so I think about 18 months to two years across most things we would retest, but we're also trying so many new things that it feels like we're testing more than that because we, we just started texting um, and you know, there's larger organizations way ahead of us and probably small organizations way, way ahead of us, but, you know, we were sending just engagement, um, texts without asks. And so we're testing those now, and now we're going to make our first ask via text. And so we're testing those. And so every new channel, when you dip into it, you have to test, but the retest, I think for us, we're about 18 months yeah. to two years. I appreciate that a lot because I, I know like it's kind of like the shiny object, you know, it's yeah. especially if it's built into the software, it's like, well, let's test again, let's test again, yeah. let's test again. Um, I'm curious as you, you know, talk about this, the cost implications. Mm -hmm. I love that you mentioned earlier, you know, it can, it can be costly, but it doesn't have to be. So, you know, right. again, as many of our viewers are probably looking at you, looking at the branding, oh, yeah. right? There's this misnomer of the connection of Dave Thomas Foundation for Adoption and Wendy's. Hey. So I would love for you to talk to us about how, you know, you've really looked at the cost of what you do, again, leading these two departments yeah. for your organization. And as Rita mentioned yesterday, this organization has not always been a multi-million dollar organization, okay. right? Like yeah. when she came in, it was less than a million. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's absolutely right. So everything that we have to do that we do, we have a very sophisticated board. Um, you know, they expect return on investment. Mm -hmm. We've got it. We've got to show that now in fundraising and in particular building a fundraising program, you know, the investment happens for a while before you see the payoff. And so it's yeah. about painting that picture of any expertise you can get from agent, how long it will take, um, that kind of thing. But I think that's really important to know, but there are, um, there are expensive ways to do the things and less expensive ways. I know that there are a lot of small, small nonprofits who, you know, when we do some of this brand awareness spend, um, we just spent about 75,000 to do um, that's the scatter reel. And then the testing, you know, on our own creative um, on. So that gives kind of an idea of, of how much something like that would, would cost. But um, you know, I've, worked at other organizations or talked to other people in other lives where you just got to get scrappy and you can do it. Um, you know what, like get together your ads, um, have them play, have some, some questions together to test your creative against each other, have a survey built, go stand out on a college campus, give everyone five bucks for state for coming through and answering that question. You know, it gives you something. Um, there are a lot of civic organizations, you know, meetings of different people, ask them to come in and do a quick little market research study and be on your way. It's a, you know, it's amazing how open people, and I've done a little bit of that stuff. You don't want to just get your friends and family because they're too connected, but, mm -hmm. but there are groups of people that you can walk in, get a hundred people to answer this thing. And it, it gives you a, a, a start, you know, at, at some data. So all the small nonprofits, we all know we're, we're scrappy with the best of them. And, and this can work that way too. You can find out answers, even with a small budget, you just got to put the work into it, get creative. Yeah. Right. You just gave me a great idea, truly for many of these small to mid-sized nonprofits. Many of them have corporate partners. You know, what can these corporate partners provide by way of a $5 gift card? You know, we had a yeah. guest on from Atlanta. Of course, she dropped Chick-fil-A a, a few times in her conversation. Yeah. Like there's so many opportunities, I think, to partner with your partners to yeah. get to these results. And I just love because for you and maybe, you know, for many others, it seems so, so basic, so easy, but many of us 
we don't know where to start, right? Like where, where do we even begin this process? And even for us, right, we, we want our brand awareness to grow faster than the, even the money that we can spend on it. We're larger than some other organizations. So our, one of our big partners was Wendy's. We were talking to their consumer research team saying, Hey, we're doing this brand research and they, they do research all the time. And they said, you know, we've spent so much money with this organization. They owe us a freebie. Right. right. <laughs> we're going to call them and ask oh them God. to do this thing. Right. So a lot of your corporate donors, they have access to that kind of stuff and would Fantastic. love to ask their vendors to do that for you. Yeah, for free. I love that. And Jerry, you are right. We need to be connecting with our partners more than just asking for the next big check. Yeah, absolutely. To, be, to say, how do we connect and how do we build this? Because it's good for them right? It's good for them yep. and their teams. And so, yeah, I love that. I think that's yep. fabulous. Yep. Well, you know, Jill, it's just so fascinating to have you on with us. And again, you know, as Jarrett said in the, in the very beginning, this is the model that you have of being the lead of both marketing and development is one that, you know, she wishes we could see more of. And and why it, while it's incredibly arduous and so sophisticated, at the same time, it's so basic. It needs mm -hmm. to be the way we think mm -hmm. um, about this whole process. And so mm -hmm. uh, it's always super fun that you come on and that you were that you're honest and that you share this information. Oh, I just so love pleasure. it, and I'm I really admire you for it because I think a lot of organizations. Um, like you said, that scatter reel, I mean, how many organizations are going to want to share what really happened? Because yeah. it, there's a competitive set, right? Yeah, right, right, right. And so, yeah, this yeah. has been amazing. Yeah. Really great. Jill yeah. Krumbacher, Senior Vice President of Marketing and Development, Dave Thomas Foundation for Adoption. Um, check out their website, DaveThomasFoundation.org. It is a beautifully done website that works through all processes, if you are engaged or pre considering being, um, you know, an adoptive family, if you want to learn about advocacy, if you want to donate, if you want to look at, you know, planned giving, all these different things, you have white papers, you have a lot of incredible research, um, and it, it's, it's really a beautifully done resource um, that far be, exceeds, I think, what most uh, organizations can even put together and so we can't say enough about this it's it's uh again dave thomas foundation.org and check it out um before we let you go and we're going to talk to rita about this a little bit more share with us why you and and some of your team were in los angeles recently for this big 25th anniversary yes. celebration we just filmed um with cbs the 25th a home for the holidays special and it is about adoption um and heavily about foster care adoption and all of the waiting children across the united states and for 25 years cvs has aired this special um we sponsor it and we are thrilled to be the website you know the the call to action yeah. as the special runs um so we just got to film the the 25th annual one it airs on uh, December 22nd at 8 p.m. Eastern time um, and great talent um, that's going to be involved this year. And we encourage it's a beautiful holiday set. It gets you gets you ready for the holidays, um, has beautiful stories of adoption. So everyone should tune in. It's I love great. that. And I need to go pick up my my frosty tag. Right. Because hey. that was Key that tag. was a yes. big gift for me last year <laughs> where it went in a lot of stockings. It was tied to a lot of cards. It was like, I'm definitely going to do this, which I have a special connection with Frosty um, anyway. So having this <laughs> as a giveaway for my family and friends was just fantastic. Yeah. Yes. And, and use those to uh, taste the, the peppermint Frosty. Oh, we, we will have to do that. You know, our executive producer mentioned the pumpkin spice Frosty. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. So. Uh -huh. <laughs> yep. Peppermint's Good my stuff. favorite. Well, Jill, you are always fantastic. This entire week has been fantastic. It is not over yet because we do have tomorrow, but we've had phenomenal leaders from Dave Thomas Foundation for Adoption. Again, the third annual nonprofit power week. So thank you for bringing these conversations to the forefront as we help to advocate 
awareness for National Adoption Month. Truly, it's it's just been a pleasure. So please do uh, take a look at the recordings for all of these conversations, trauma and working in the nonprofits, realities of founder syndrome. Rita was fantastic to share. I love that she's like, I don't want to overstay my welcome. I need to, I need to read the room. I just thought that was adorable. It was great. Testing your marketing plan with you, Jill. Again, there's so much for us to learn. Um, And we started the week with researching and changing attitudes. And we will wrap up tomorrow for our Friday episode, Ask and Answer again with Rita Sorenen, President and CEO of the Dave Thomas Foundation for Adoption. Julia Patrick, always fun to be here with you. I'm Jarrett Ransom. As we sign off today, we also want to give gratitude to our amazing partners. So thank you to Fundraising Academy at National University, Bloomerang, your part-time controller, Nonprofit Thought Leader, American Nonprofit Academy, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Nerd, as well as Tech Talk, Nonprofit Tech Talk. So thank you again to these companies that allow us to have these conversations. Always a pleasure, Jill. So thank you for joining us today. Pleasure. It's been a lot of fun. And it's it's really amazing work that I think that all nonprofits can learn from and what you do, whether it's the topic near and dear to your heart, um, just the brilliance with which you pursue your business and you pursue a, a national framework for your, your uh, founder's vision. It, it has been a remarkable discovery and, and we just love these conversations. As Jared said, join us tomorrow. It'll be our final day with Rita Alsornan, CEO and president of the Dave Thomas Foundation for Adoption. It's gonna be a, a little different ask and answer because we, Um, are asking her questions that we have, some that have come in from our viewers, but mostly questions that we have about the whole ecosystem of the organization and how she navigates it along with her brilliant team. And so you won't want to miss it because it's really an opportunity to get inside the head of a phenomenal leader. Hey, Jarrett, every day we sign off, and I think this week it's been incredibly profound with this message, and it goes like this to stay well so you can do well. Thank you ladies so much and we'll see you back here tomorrow.